Marhaba Ibra Army and welcome back to another Ibra Corp video. Thanks for coming back today. In today's episode, we're going to be showing you the next step in our Ibra NAS killer build, which is covering Proxmox. If you already run Proxmox and you're quite comfortable with it, then you probably already know most of the things that we're going to show in this video. However, there are some things that maybe you didn't know or maybe you would just like to know and just want to stick around and help support the channel, then we really appreciate it. Other ways you can help support the channel is by donating, liking and subscribing. All of those things really help us keep going here at Ibracorp and we put it straight back into the content and we hope that it's reflected in the content that we have been creating. So in this step, we're creating a new Proxmox server installation and then we'll switch to our existing setup here, which we've got, and I'll show you how we achieved what we're looking at right now. And this, of course, is going to be our absolute base for when we get to the end, which is having our ZFS array on TrueNAS. So if you're continuing the series, you want to see the next step and you want to carry on and hopefully get a great media server by the end of this journey, then stick around and let's get stuck into it. Okay guys, welcome back to episode two or part two of the series. Now guys, thank you very much for all the comments you guys have been putting down on the previous video. I've seen every single comment, the team has seen every single comment and it's great to see the feedback. You know, that's the sort of stuff we need to see. And I think something important that we need to make everyone know about, we're happy to learn new things and different ways to go about, you know, achieving the same outcome. I just want to make it clear from now that anything that we might show here is not always set in stone. There are, as they say, many ways to skin a cat. And in our scenario, this is the way we're going to skin this cat. But if you have a different method, different way you like to do things, be sure to let us know and let other community members know. But overall, you guys seem quite interested in the series, so we're really happy to see that and we're happy to continue doing it for you. So naturally, the next step is we want to install Proxmox, okay? That's what we want to get done today. And we want to show you a couple of things that we'll do to help establish the server. So let's quickly just give an overview of Proxmox for those who don't use it, maybe don't know anything about it, and are wondering, you know, why we involve it here in this process. So currently, Proxmox, as described on their website here, proxmox.com, it's an open source virtualization platform. It allows us to have great backups, run VMs, run Linux containers, as well as physical hosts and it helps you link them all up in different ways. For example, we can set up clustering so that, you know, if you had three servers and they were clustered together, you know, if one of those servers went down that was hosting a bunch of VMs, one of the other servers in the cluster will actually pick them up. And Ibracorp currently utilizes this technology. Big thank you to DiskDuck and Hawks as usual for that. And many of our online services now are actually clustered. So when you might notice our website go down, for example, within about three to five minutes, usually the VM will be migrated to one of the other cluster nodes. And sure enough, the website will be back up again. And that's the sort of stuff that makes this, I guess, what you would consider an enterprise solution. Because on that level, you really want that reliability and uptime. It also gives you redundancy, of course, servers being in different locations and things. So there's a few things that can do. It's a virtual environment, it's a backup server, and it's also a mail gateway if you choose to use that. You don't have to use this. You don't even have to use that. You can just use the virtual environment if that's what you want to do. But the flexibility is there. And on top of that, we're talking free. It doesn't cost a single cent. Okay, you can uh, purchase enterprise support, um, which will give you a whole bunch of updates and things like that but it's really aimed at enterprise customers for that solution. It's pretty expensive. I looked it up myself in Australia, it's quite expensive. So you don't need to do that if you don't wanna do that. So that's the basic overview. If you guys want to read more about Proxmox, of course, we suggest you go to their official website and any other sources that you might suggest. Let us know in the comments. We've, we've found some great sources as well, some other YouTube channels. Uh, be sure to check out Lawrence Systems. They do some fantastic work over there and we hope to work with them one day and get involved with a project together. That would be really fun. But we really suggest their videos on uh, this sort of stuff as well. They do great work. And also our friend Brian over at Awesome Open Source does some great videos as well. So be sure to check his channel out too. So with this out of the way, the next step is we want to get the ISO, create a bootable USB and get started on an installation. So on the same page, we go to downloads and you'll see a whole bunch of options here. It looks a little bit funky because I'm using Dark Reader to try and make it easier on you guys watching this. Otherwise, it's quite a white screen. And we've got Proxmox VE 7.1 ISO right here. Okay, but what we're gonna do is actually just download the ISO like this, 
clicking download and then we'll download the ISO to our computer. Now let's say if you bear with me here for a moment that you have never created a bootable USB before. I just want to show you a couple of different methods you can use so that you can uh, do this quite easily and efficiently. So maybe you know about Rufus, it's been around for a long time and Rufus is a great tool for creating bootable USBs and will take your ISO, maybe other formats as well, and it will allow you to configure how you want the bootable USB to work. Now Rufus has never really failed me, it's been a great tool, especially working in IT. It's, a, it's a, I would consider one of the essential tools that you could carry on your belt or in your toolkit, software toolkit. But I'm going to show you one other option that you might be interested in if you haven't tried it before. So now what you're looking at, if you go to ventoy.net, is Ventoy. It's a new bootable USB solution. Now there's a whole bunch of information here, a lot of details. If you guys love your details, it's all there. We want to cover the important notes, but here's some highlights here, okay? So fast, great. Directly boot from ISO, WIM, IMG, and VHD EFI files, no extraction needed. That's a big one, and I'll explain to you in a moment. We've got all sorts of partition styles. We have the auto installation for Windows is supported. So you've got different partition formats you can use. ISOs that are larger than four gig are supported. So if some of you know when using FAT32 and making those USBs bigger than four gigabytes can become a problem. Now, what does this do? Okay, quite simply, as opposed to Rufus, which takes a USB, formats it, puts the ISO on there, and that then becomes a USB for that one ISO. Ventoy, on the other hand, actually allow you to copy and paste the disk images that you want on the USB. And it doesn't matter about folders or anything, it will scan through every single folder and every single layer. So you can have, you know, neat folders the way you like it to make you find the images easier. But in terms of Ventoy, what it sees, it literally sees everything. So when you eventually plug your USB into your computer, you boot from that USB and then it will immediately take you to this screen. And you basically just scroll through and pick the OS or ISO that you want to use, hit it, and next thing you know, it will start straight away. So this allows you to have multiple different tools, multiple different ISOs, systems, whatever you want, on the one USB stick, utilizing most of that space. And it's a simple copy paste, you know, you just copy the ISO in and away you go. So I would actually consider now, currently, up to date, this is one of my favorite tools, and um, I've got to thank this stuck for this one. He showed me this tool, so um, it was new to me. So I hope you guys check that one out. I think it's a great tool, the ventoy.net. All right, so I'm gonna assume you've plugged in your USB, you've booted from the ISO or the image that you found, and you're confronted with the Proxmox login screen now. Now currently I'm running this through a KVM, so that's why it looks this way, but on yours it would probably look full screen, attached to your screen directly. So in here, we're just gonna go with install Proxmox VE. Let that load, we'll give that some time. Okay, so then you're confronted with the user license agreement. So if you agree to that, go ahead and click agree. Now I want to give you a couple of options, okay? First, it's gonna ask us what hard disk we wanna install Proxmox on. Now I simulated a bunch of disks here just to give you an idea how it could look if you have multiple disks showing up. And it really depends, of course, on what you wanna do. But if you're following our IbraNAS guide, then you should have an SSD in this queue ready to go. Now in our first video, we showed you how much space we had, which is 120 gig SSD. So that means the SSD itself here, I'm gonna consider that the SSD, SDA disk. And then I added just a couple of extra ones to simulate multiple disks. So in our case, we're going to click on 120 gig. We'll go to options here, and we're gonna change the format to XFS. Go ahead and click okay, and then we click next. But before I do, I'll just quickly open it back up again. You obviously have a whole different range of options if you choose to use them this way. Now, like we said, there are many ways to skin a cat. And if you have built your server differently, maybe you don't have an SSD, you use something else. Maybe you have two NVMEs on your server, then you really have nothing to worry about. You can go ahead and use this. You can change the format to whatever suits you. In our case, XFS is what's recommended. That's what we recommend. It's a very stable file format. And since we're not running any ZFS on the actual core SSD, we don't need to worry about ZFS here. So again, we go to XFS, click OK, and click Next. And then it's gonna ask you for your country, time zone, and keyboard layout. Now, for some reason, you would think if it automatically detected Australia, it would pick somewhere other than Antarctica. But luckily for us, Australia is right near the top anyway, so we'll go ahead and click Australia, Melbourne. I'm happy with the US English keyboard. We'll leave that as is and click Next. Now we have to set up our admin password and confirm it. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so we've done the password and we have an email address. Go ahead and click Next. 
Then you get asked to set up your LAN interface. Now in our case, I have a one interface pass through and that's because we're using this VM. However, on your server, you may have the multiple network interface cards, which we recommend. And if you haven't seen that, go to our NAS Killer playlist and watch the first video on our hardware setup to understand how this may look different. With that hardware, we would have multiple network interfaces here. So just pick the one that you want to be your interface for Proxmox to communicate on. This can also be separate to a network you wanna set up for anything else. So not everything has to come through this interface. This is just asking about your Proxmox one. So naturally we wanna keep it on our LAN network so we can reach it pretty easily. So we're gonna leave that as 103, that's fine. Click next. Do we want it to automatically reboot? We're gonna say yes and click install. So now it's pretty much gonna install for us. We just have to sit back and wait and just give it some time to install. Once the installer is finished, we're shown a IP address and told that that's how we're gonna access it once the server restarts. Now the server is restarting, we can see it's going to automatically boot into Proxmox. So at this point, if you're happy and the boot order is correct on your server, you can now safely rely on putting the server back where it belongs. Alternatively, you can stay connected until you log in to the user interface just to be sure that you can reach everything okay. Okay, now on the terminal, we can see that that's ready to go. So let's close this. And I've typed in the address in my browser. It gives us that warning, that's fine. We click unsafe. And by now, you probably realize just how bright this thing is. Proxmox is very bright by default. And for some reason, it just doesn't have a dark mode yet. Let's hope that comes in the future, but in the meantime, we have a solution for you. So just hold on a second. So we put in root as our username and the password that you set up in the installing wizard. Go ahead and click login. The first thing we're gonna to be told is that we don't have a valid subscription for this server. That's okay. As I was saying earlier, there are premium subscriptions for enterprise customers and that allows them to get enterprise features and downloads. So the first thing we're gonna do is click OK, and under Data Center, go ahead and click PVE. Now this is the node, okay? We actually name this PVE. You can name it anything else. We don't suggest naming it after you've already set up the server. So if you're not happy with the name of your node, best to just reinstall now, then try and do anything later. Under PVE, we'll go to Updates, go to Repositories, and you'll see these are the default repositories that are in here currently. So what we wanna do, is just highlight this enterprise one and click on disable. Then we're gonna go ahead and add one. So click on add and select the no subscription option that you see here. Go ahead and click add. So now we can get updates that are for the non-subscribers. Once that's done, go to updates and click on refresh. And just a little tip for you, when using Proxmox, if you see any of these windows open up, you can actually close the window. You don't need to leave it open. You can carry on working on something else and you'll actually see it happening down here in the logs. And then at any point, you can just double click it, open it up, and you can stop something if you want or just see where it's up to. So that's a handy little tip for you. So with the updates refreshed, you can see there's quite a few updates here. So what we wanna do is click now on upgrade. It's gonna open up the terminal where you can see the action happening and it's gonna prompt you to say yes. Of course, you can all always do this through the terminal if you wanna SSH into the server, you can do that as well. Uh, by default, it's on port 22. Okay, so now the updates are done, we're going to implement something else while we've got the terminal already open. Now in our description, you'll find the link to the Discord dark theme. We also added it to last week's video too. So all we have to do is paste that into the terminal and execute it. Okay, so now that that's done, we have dark theme installed, but we also have a kernel update. So it's really important that we restart the server now and come back to it once it's done. Then here we'll just type in reboot. Okay, the server has rebooted and as you can see now, it's nice and dark, which is exactly what we want. At any point you can go to the summary screens here and it'll give you a nice little breakdown of what's going on. And you can then go down the chain. So you've got the node, which is our actual server, and how much work that particular server is doing. Okay, so one of the first things you probably wanna do once you've now got Proxmox all ready, is maybe you wanna set up a virtual machine and just get playing with that. Now in our series, we're gonna be showing you using Ubuntu 20.04 for a server. So we'll be using Ubuntu Server 20.04. I've just gone to the Ubuntu website here and we've just grabbing a Ubuntu desktop ISO for us. 
just to show you something different to what we're covering in the series to give you an example of something else. So once you go to the site, maybe you've got your favorite mirror where you get your Ubuntu images from, go there. In this case, we've gone here and we've just right clicked the download now option. And we wanna make sure that as you can see in the bottom left here, that it's directly to the file. So in this case it is, it's going to an ISO file. I'll show you why in just a second. Now, if you come back here, by default, we have two local storage locations. One is local LVM and the other one is just local. If we click on local LVM, we'll see that disks are stored in here as well as CT volumes and can set their permissions as well. Local, on the other hand, allows us to have backups, ISO images, templates, as well as permissions there too. So under ISO images, where we want, go to ISO images and click on download from URL. And we're gonna paste the direct link here and we'll query that URL, which returns successfully the name of the ISO. Go ahead and click download. Now this simplifies the process a lot because we don't have to download the ISO on our main computer, copy it over you know, the network or anything like that. We can just tell the server to grab it directly from the source and that saves us time and uses bandwidth appropriately as well. And like I said, while this is going, we can just go ahead and close the window and down here you'll see it's still ticking away. So we can work on other stuff. The alternative to that, of course, is if you can't, for whatever reason, use a direct link, you can just download the ISO to your computer that you're using and just go ahead and click upload. You can then select the file, click open, and then upload it. Now in this sense, we have a PFSense ISO, so I'll just do that as well. But of course, it's much quicker, it's much smaller, and it's coming over the LAN rather than through the web. And now we have a PFSense ISO ready and waiting, for our future video, wink wink. And while we're waiting for the ISO to download, let's look at some of the settings that you've got here in PVE. We're not gonna to cover too much just yet. We don't wanna overload you if you're brand new to Proxmox, but a couple of things worth noting. So if we go to disks, for example, this is gonna show us all of our disks that are passed through. Now, if you're using our method and you have a HBA card, you may not see those disks that are attached to the card in this list. Um, the card has control of that, so you, we will pass that card directly for TrueNAS scale. In this case though, being a VM, these are just passed through as VM disks. So here is our main installation and all the supporting partitions. Then if we go down the side, we can start seeing some other settings. So we can set up our network interfaces here. You can set up certificates, your DNS, your hosts. Uh, the time and making sure that's correct is really important. You've also got a system log that you can read as well. Again, any updates. The controls for firewall. Ceph installation, which we're not gonna be doing in this video, but keep an eye out for that one. And then you have all your configs for ZFS under the disks as well. We also have replication, which as it says, requires at least two nodes. Okay, so you can set up two servers and set up replication through that. And then any task history. So if you wanted to just monitor it, you could do it. And if you go to data center, again, you have very similar things, but it applies to the very top level of your setup. So you can have users here, for example, set up multiple users, set up multiple pools, permissions to them. You can also add storage location. And we'll cover that in the upcoming episode in the series as it relates to the TrueNAS installation. You've also got your clusters. This is where we were talking about. You can create and join clusters. And then you also have a summary here again which allows you to monitor all the nodes that are under the same data center. Okay, so with the ISO complete and the downloads done, we'll close this window and then we will create a VM. So in the top right corner, you'll see create VM there. Let's click that. So in the name, we'll just say Ubuntu desktop. There are some formatting requirements to meet. So it will go red if you enter a character that's not accepted. So with that, we can go next and it will ask us where we want to load this from. So do we have an ISO, maybe have a physical CD drive, or you can just choose not to pass anything. Now in a scenario where you would select do not use any media is if we wanna pass through Unraid, for example, which needs to live on a USB stick. Since we're doing Ubuntu, let's click on that. And I will show you Unraid as well by the end of this video too. The Ubuntu ISO, we'll click next. It's gonna ask you what kind of disks that you want. So in here, we are going to leave everything as per normal. However, if you were running something like Windows 11, we can actually emulate the TPM requirement that Windows requires. So you can check that there. You can change the BIOS, for example, to UEFI. And with those settings, you will then be able to start up Windows 11. Obviously, if you're doing Windows 11 on the OS screen, you would then go to Windows, 
and select the type of windows that you have. You also have Solaris kernel there and other. So again, we're stuck with Linux. We'll go next, next, and then we can add our disks. Now, as part of our TrueNAS series, we're setting up the Ubuntu VM with one single disk. And the reason is we just want Ubuntu to live on this disk, on this VDisk. Everything else is going to live on our array, which is on TrueNAS. So in that case, just allocate one disk with the size that you prefer. So in our case, we'll go with 50 gig, for example, and click next. For the cores, let's give it a quad core to start with. For the RAM, we're gonna allocate 4096, so four gig of RAM. Go ahead and click next. And as you can see, there is, there is an advanced option down here. So if we just check that, you'll be confronted with a couple of more options. And what we wanna do is uncheck ballooning device for this purpose. Then you get to network. So, so we'll select the bridge that we want. Currently, we only have the one bridge and that will put us on the network. You can leave firewall enabled if you like. You can also disable it if you have your own firewall running too. Once you're done, click next. And then what we're gonna do is actually just click finish. Don't check start after created and I'll show you why. So currently the VM is being created and we can see it up here now with ID 100. Ubuntu desktop, it's done. The start option is now enabled and allows us to actually start the VM. But first we're gonna go through a couple of options and I'll show you some things that are really important to note. So if you go to hardware, you can see all of our hardware here. So we have the memory allocated, we have the processes allocated. There is something we're gonna change. Now the reason why I left it till now is so that you can see how you can change it from this screen. So with the processor, select it and click edit. In the type, instead of KVM, which is the default, KVM64, so it's emulated, we can actually pass through the actual host CPU. So go ahead and select host and click okay. So now it's gonna be pulling our actual host CPU for this VM rather than emulating it. The next thing we can do is set all sorts of hardware that we want. So now we're on our actual live system. And as you can see, it's a little bit more filled out and we'll get to that stuff when the time comes. But at the moment, I just want to show you the comparable virtual machine. So here's a virtual machine with all the devices passed through correctly because we're not using a VM. So as you can see from this list, we've got our memory there, we've got our processor set to host, and we've also got our hard disks, network device, and the PCI device. If you go to add and click on PCI device, open it up and you're gonna see a whole bunch of things here. Now, obviously this is PCI devices, as the name would suggest. In here is where you would select your Intel GPU. So if your processor has a built-in GPU, such as the Intel range, support the UHD graphics or HD graphics, then you can actually pass that through to the VM, which is really important when we're talking about setting up a media server. So I would then select this option and click on add. Now I already have the device there, as you can see, so then it's added it again. So I'm actually just going to revert the change. And once you're done, go ahead again and click on PCI device again. There's other stuff you can pass through here too, which we'll cover in the next episode, which will cover the TrueNAS installation. But you can see a whole bunch of stuff that you can pass through if you wanted to. You could even pass through an SSD directly to another VM. Okay, but at the moment that SSD is actually running as our Proxmox installation. So we probably don't wanna chew up too much space there. And once you're happy with all that, you can pretty much just go ahead and start the virtual machine. Once you start it, you'll be confronted with the typical interface for Ubuntu installation. And I'm sure you can follow it through from there. But the first thing you'll need to know is how to access it. So once you start a virtual machine, you can actually just click on console up here and it will open up your KVM console. And you can basically see it working straight off the bat. As you can see, I actually have an issue with mine, so I'm gonna be rebooting that now. So what we wanna do is sign in and we've signed into the virtual machine. If you're using your SSH client, you can then just use that client. You can use something like Putty, you can use something like Termius. I highly recommend Termius. It is a paid product though, so each to their own. I like it, it does what I need it to do, and so I'm happy to pay for it. But I know some people prefer the free options, and there are plenty there. Uh, one that you can actually use is called Tabby. And for those looking for a free and open source alternative, that's an option you have there as well. So let's say you've got the VM set up, that's all done, okay? We have a virtual machine going, we know how it works. You don't need to do anything further. So this was just to show you an example of setting up a virtual machine. The actual install and setup of the Ubuntu server that we want to create, uh, which is going to be for our Plex Media Server setup, will be in one of the following episodes of this series, when we get to it, okay? So we're just building our way to that. So once you're happy with all this, we can close it. 
So now that we have a working virtual machine or multiple virtual machines in this case, you might wanna think about creating some backups. Of course, it's really important to take backups and Proxmox makes this really easy. So under a virtual machine here, you can actually go to backup and you can just select backup now, for example, and it will take an entire snapshot of that virtual machine and store that for you wherever you've allocated. It also remembers the configuration of that virtual machine. So if you wanted to see what config you had for that VM, that's available too. You can change the protection so that any sort of scheduled backups, which we'll talk about in a minute, make sure they don't remove that particular entry so that you can keep it safe. So let's say you have the perfect setup and you know that if anything ever happened, just launching that backup uh, or restoring that backup will bring everything the way it was before. But better yet, why don't you schedule them? Let's go to data center up here, for example, and select backup. Now in here, I've already created one, but let's create one together and I'll show you what it looks like. So go ahead and click add. And we've got a couple of different options. Now, we have multiple nodes, you will see multiple nodes. You can leave it as all, but let's say we only want this node to backup. What's our storage we're using? We have one called backups, and that's living on our TrueNAS array, so we'll cover that. The schedule, so how often do you want that to backup? Let's say every day at 9 p.m. Then you can select what VMs you want to back up. So in our case, we already have one that backs up every VM. But let's say you just wanted to back up a few. So let's go with, instead of all, we'll go include selected VMs. And we can say, I only want you to back up this VM. We obviously want it enabled and the mode is set to snapshot. Okay, so it will be able to run with the VM running and without any interruptions, which is great. If you go to retention, then we can set up how long we want to keep those backups and allow it to cycle through them. Otherwise, if you just keep storing the backups, it will actually end up filling your storage up. So what we do is set up our schedule. So I want you to say, for example, keep the last seven backups. Now, if I have a policy that says every day at 9 p.m. and I'm saying keep the seven, then we have one full seven days worth, one per day, keeping seven. Then once it reaches the eighth day, it will remove the first one earliest done and that will allow you to have a constant refresh and allow the backups to stay fresh and uh, you know stay recent but also give you some time to go back if you prefer you can go longer you can go 14 days 30 days 90 days it all depends on your storage capacity and uh, how big your vms are of course and speaking of that once you're done here and you submit it something to also note is that the backups work with snapshotting so every new backup is only going to grow by the difference of the last backup. So here, for example, you can see how it steadily starts growing because the VM itself has grown. So we have eight, nine, two, nine, 10, 11, getting up to 12 gig there. And that was done today at midnight. So essentially the VM itself is getting bigger, but it's only gonna be keeping the difference. And another reason why we don't have our media stored on this virtual machine. I know some people are asking why we don't have it directly on there. This allows us to back up the actual VM itself separate to the data storage. All right guys, so that covers backups as well. And finally, the last thing I'm gonna show you to end the video is how to pass through Unraid. I know some of you are using Unraid. Well, I'm still using Unraid as well. And a few comments last week might've been, you know, a little bit unsure, we didn't make it clear. And they may have got the impression that we are completely walking away from Unraid. That's not the case at all, guys. We're actually, we love Unraid and we still use it side by side with this setup. We're just expanding our content. So we still use it and we still have it running and we really enjoy it. We're just showing some more options for those who are looking for them. And the community response was pretty clear. They love seeing more options. So that's what we're doing. So let's say we wanted to pass through a virtual machine so that we can get Unraid going. How do we do that? So I showed you earlier how to actually configure the virtual machine options when we click create VM. The first things first, I'll show you the hardware that we've got configured. Under hardware here, we've got memory, so four gig of RAM, a dual core processor. And the reason is we're not actually, this isn't our live Unraid server. I'm just doing this to show you guys how we can set it up. So if it's gonna be your actual Unraid server and you want it running through Proxmox, give it the resources that you want. And the same thing applies here. Give it the processor that is the host. So if we go down and we select host, go okay. You give that the host, scroll down further. So these are the virtual disks I've allocated to the VM for the purposes of this video. And so you would select the disks that you have on your actual server. Now in my case here, I've got a 50 gig that has some different settings. And the reason is that's our cache disk. If we click edit, you can set that to write through and then discard. If you check advanced, you can also select SSD emulation. 
Now, if you know that the disk is on an SSD, then you can emulate that directly into the VM. In your case, you may not have a virtual disk. You may have actually passed through a physical NVMe or SSD disk, which is your cache. In that case, make sure you select SSD emulation here. Once you're done, go ahead and click OK. The other thing we need to add is a USB. As you know, if you're using Unraid, it runs on a USB. So go ahead and click Add, USB device, and then select the device from the list. Here's mine here, so we would select Cruiser Fit. And one final thing that we'll do before we start the virtual machine is the boot priority. So if we then go to options and under boot order, we'll select that, click on edit, and then find the USB that we passed through, which is right here, check it as enabled, and then move it up to the top. Now I think we're pretty much ready to start this up. Let's see how it looks. Click on start and then open the console. So here we go, Unraid OS starting. So straight away the USB has been detected. Now in our scenario here, the IP address that Unraid is actually living on is our old IP address that has now been reassigned elsewhere. So what we can do is reboot it again and then select the GUI mode and we'll change the IP address that way. And so what I had to do was just boot into the GUI mode off the USB, change it here, and now I can access it through our browser. So what I'm gonna do just to get out of the GUI mode is actually just reboot it again. And here we are. In our normal browser, we can now access it via the network and it should all just carry on as we were. Of course, you're talking about different disks if you've already formatted your disks or anything like that. So it's up to you how you wanna set this up. The important thing is though, this gives you an actual place to test new releases of Unraid and other sorts of OSs without harming your main system. So if you're still running Unraid as your main server and that's your host, that's perfectly fine. Maybe you have a small server sitting at home that you can set up with Proxmox just to test stuff out without harming your main system. The alternative is, of course, you can run those VMs directly on Unraid 2, but the Proxmox options to give you backups and things like that may be beneficial for you so that you can back up a release before testing it. So let's say we have Osiris here. We'll go to backup and we're gonna back this up right now. As you can see, the VM has been running the entire time. So we haven't actually allocated anything to it. It's just running as is. Okay, so now the backup is complete. Let's close that. And let's say at some point you made a change, you busted your OS and you want to recover it again. You basically go to the VM, select the backup that you wanna restore and click on restore. So then it will ask you where you want the disk, the VDisk to be stored. Now currently, if you just leave it blank, it will use the configuration that was in the backup itself. So it will remember where it was originally. If you wanted to, for example, recover it to another disk, another location entirely, you can do so. For example, we have our Ibranas VM there. That's where it lives currently. But if we wanted to then move it to somewhere else, we could just select that option here. We'll leave it as it is, and then we'll click start after restore. Click on restore, and it will say it will permanently erase the current VM data. That's fine, click yes. And sure enough, the backup is complete, and the VM has started now with that backup in mind. So guys, that's setting up our Proxmox server. It's now ready to go and get started with the next step in our IbraNAS series. So the next stage will be getting the TrueNAS VM set up and configured. We'll set up the shares, we'll share them back, and then we will show you how to set that up back in Proxmox as well. Following that will be the VM, so our Ubuntu VM and how we've set it up for our media server. Again, I would absolutely love to hear all your different ideas of how you would implement this, whether you would do things differently. Maybe you want to install directly on Proxmox rather than use TrueNAS. Uh, perhaps you want to use TrueNAS directly rather than Proxmox. Share your reason why, we'd love to know. It's helping us learn and it helps other community members learn as well. We really appreciate you coming to check out today's video as part of our new series. We can't wait to keep going with it. And if you'd like to help support us, you can do as little as liking the video to help show YouTube that we deserve some more attention. Alternatively, you can donate to us and please join our Discord to be part of the conversation. We would love to have you there. Thanks guys, we'll see you in the next Ibricorp video.